Welcome to the webinar, everyone. My name is Jurgen Abo. I'm head of marketing here at Convoso. We're going to start very, very soon in just a few seconds. We have a number of attendees joining at the moment, so we're just giving everybody enough time so that nobody misses any of this good stuff. Uh, we have great speakers here, so give us just a few seconds and we'll get started. Thank you. All right, just as a matter of housekeeping, if you have questions, we encourage you to follow up with any of the speakers right after this. Uh, we have a jam-packed session here, so there's going to be a ton of content and will likely not be a lot of time at the end to, to uh, ask questions. So just feel free to, to hit us up. We will have uh, information towards the end with contact information for everyone. So with that, we're getting ready to start here. Um, we have three speakers today. And I'm going to pass it to our first one, uh, Michelle. And uh, Michelle will take it from here. And everybody on the webinar, thank you again for joining us. This will be an excellent session. Thanks, Jorgen, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are in the United States right now. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar today. We have some really great information to cover. and some of the latest updates in the world of uh, consent and obtaining consent and what the regulators think about that. Uh, I'm Michelle Schuster, and I'm a founding partner of McMurray & Schuster. Uh, we're a law firm based in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, we uh, were founded by four former consumer protection chiefs and a former attorney general and have continued our work from the consumer protection section on the other side to assist companies with uh, complying with uh, advertising and marketing uh, direct to consumer sales, uh, basically, uh, to help them with their compliance programs and uh, litigation needs. Um, we also have on the webinar with us today, uh, Nima, who is the CEO and co-founder of Convoso. Hi, guys. And we also have Josh C Stevens, who's a senior associate at McMurray & Schuster, uh, also former in-house counsel and uh, an integral part of our compliance team here. Hello, everyone. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Obviously, we always start with a disclaimer uh, that uh, we are not providing legal advice. It is always a good idea if you have questions to seek out uh, legal advice about your specific situations uh, so that uh, uh, you get uh, good advice about how your specific company should proceed. Uh, also, we are not creating an attorney-client relationship for uh, purposes of providing uh, this webinar. This webinar is a second web, is the second webinar in a series of webinars uh, that we will be conducting over the uh, next several months. The last webinar, uh, which occurred last month, was uh, on the first two bullet uh, points that you see on this slide, the TCPA and the TSR. We're picking up on the uh, tail end of the TCPA discussion with this webinar. We're going to talk about texting. We were focused primarily on phone calls on the previous webinar. And so we'll start the webinar with talking about texting regu regulations. They mirror to a large extent the, telemar the telemarketing regulations in that a text is considered a, uh, a uh, telephone call to a uh, mobile device. And so uh, we'll, be, we'll be picking up there. I would also say that uh, for the next two webinars that we have that um, are under the uh, fourth and the sixth um, bullet points, or I'm sorry, the third and the fifth bullet points, the state and uh, actually federal telemarketing laws. We're also going to include a privacy discussion in that, so you'll shortly receive information on that next webinar. And then uh, we'll finish with a, a, an in-depth discussion on call blocking and labeling issues that I know are affecting a lot of you that are out there um, in the consumer marketing space right now. So you'll get uh, information about those two webinars over the next uh, uh, month or so. 
So with that, uh, for today's webinar, we will be, as I said, starting with a discussion of texting under the TCPA. Uh, also, uh, we'll lead from there into a discussion of prior express written consent. We'll be referring to that as PEWC uh, throughout the presentation, and specifically why PEWC is so important in the lead generation space and those that are using uh, leads generated uh, by others uh, for them to use. Also, the FTC has been pretty vocal recently on the topic of lead generation. Josh is going to give you a, a detailed view of the enforcement actions that the FTC has initiated lately. And then uh, last and, and probably most important for those of you on the phone is best practices for obtaining consent from consumers that will uh, meet the PEWC uh, requirements uh, under the TCPA. So let's start with kind of where we left off uh, with the TCPA on the, um, the, the general rule. And um, we're, we're assuming that most people know that the uh, TCPA is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It's enforced by the FCC and that there is a private right of action under the TCPA that allows damages from uh, 500 to 1500 per call, and so uh, that's why the TCPA has become such a, a big issue for us recently. The penalties multiply very quickly, and the standards for finding liability are um, very low if you're not aware of what the TCPA uh, requires, uh, requires callers or texters to do. Um, so for purposes of our discussion around texting, it's important that you know that you have to have the called party or the text party's consent to use an automatic telephone dialing system or an ATDS um, to call or text cell phones as the case may be here. So uh, what is an ATDS has been the source of much controversy over the last many years. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, you should obtain legal opinion on the, the system that you're using for texting. Uh, if it's a texting platform that can send text without any type of human intervention, um, there is an argument that that would be an ATDS. Uh, so uh, very important that you understand what type of platform you're using so you know what type of laws you must comply with. Uh, if you have a, a click to text, uh, meaning that each text is sent out uh, via um, a, a, a click or a touch by a human agent or an, an agent, I should say, uh, that's sending out those text messages you'd, and the system isn't capable of functioning in any other way, uh, you probably have a pretty good argument that it's not an ATDS. Um, so make sure you know what type of platform that you are using. If you are using an ATDS and you're making marketing texts, you have to have written consent. And it's, in, uh, it's uh, been uh, well established that if you have a call that is for transactional purposes and marketing purposes, meaning that it is a mixed purpose call, an example might be you're calling or texting to remind somebody about an upcoming payment. But at the end of the message you say, also we're releasing a new product that will, uh, that will uh, provide some service to you, to, to the consumer. Uh, with that, what we would call an upsell at the end of that message, that would be a mixed purpose uh, call or a mixed purpose text. You're sending the transactional, your payment is due along with, hey, purchase this additional uh, product. If it's a mixed purpose, uh, text, then it's going to be treated as a marketing text, meaning, go back to the top of the slide, you're going to need uh, prior express written consent for, uh, for sending that text out. Also, um, the, uh, I, I'm, still, uh, I'm still in awe that folks are surprised that the TCPA applies not only to messages to consumers, but also B2B messages. So understand that this is a little bit broader than some of the other telemarketing regulations that you would be used to. Also, there are state texting rules that go a little bit further uh, than the federal TCPA regulations. Uh, on the state level, they may not care what type of equipment you're using. So for your manual texting platforms, you may require an EBR if you don't have consent uh, in order to send that text message. So it's important that once you've done the TCPA analysis, you also take a moment to take a look at 
states that have more restrictive regulations than the TCPA, and that's what's represented on uh, the chart that is on the, the, the screen now. Uh, also, in addition to the state regulations and the TCPA, there are industry associations that have put, put out best practices. And I, I emphasize the point that these are best practices. They are not legal requirements. And these best practices come into play because some of the texting platforms or the communications providers may require contractually companies that are using their platforms to comply with the CTIA or the MMA, um, the Mobile Marketing Association guidelines. So you still need to know about these because this um, may not get you into legal problems unless you're violating a contract, but it may prevent you from using that platform to send your texts. Um, so as I said, these are best practices for using short code text messages. Uh, so these are the, the shortened digits to send text messages instead of a, uh, an entire phone number. Um, the um, best practices were something that were developed over a, a number of years by the industry uh, to provide the industry regulatory guidance in the hope of um, uh, preventing the uh, state and federal regulators um, enacting more restrictive regulations than they, often, than they already had. And as I said, it's a, it's a requirement that some of the texting platforms have. So let's go over um, at a high level uh, what those uh, guidelines are. So the program terms and conditions. Uh, so these are um, for those uh, companies that are offering texting platforms. There are some specific guidelines for what must be contained in that program's terms and conditions and uh, presumably uh, their uh, contract contracts and contractual obligations. And that is uh, they must have information on the sponsor of the program. Basically, the platforms are required to know who their customers are and they must impose certain um, requirements on them, and that is that uh, the text would send out a stop instruction, um, meaning the, um, the term stop would automatically result in an opt-out from future uh, texting, uh, future text being sent. Uh, that stop would need to be in bold. Also, you'll frequently see on these uh, text messages that message and data rates may apply. Uh, that's required under the MMA standards. Uh, for platform pro providers. And also a toll-free number, web submission forms, or email address for questions uh, so that the folks that are using their platform uh, will be able to be contacted in case, of, uh, in case of issues. And then the expected frequency of messages. Um, uh, for purposes of frequency of me messages, um, I will tell you that it can cause problems to specify in not so much the platform providers' uh, contractual uh, obligations, but those that are using the platform. If you specify a frequency of messages as saying that you're only going to send three, or only one maybe, and you send more than that number, uh, then there can be liability under the consumer protection laws for engaging in deceptive behavior, meaning you didn't do what you said you were going to do, which was only send a certain number of messages. Uh, and then all other material terms and conditions uh, for, using, for using that platform. Uh, and then for the, um, the folks that are sending the text messages, there are also best practices uh, that the MMA guidelines specify, and um, that is for any advertisements that are happening um, uh, about the text message platform. So this might be uh, my law firm is sending out uh, emails to um, individuals to subscribe to our blog. So we would have to provide the program name and description. It might be the MS uh, Compliance Now blog and disclose that we'll send uh, updates whenever there's breaking news. Uh, there would have to be some type of link to the program terms and conditions, so that would presumably send you to our website, uh, which would also contain our privacy policy. And then also uh, that if you uh, text STOP once you've initiated um, uh, or become a part of this program, that we would honor those uh, STOP uh, the stop instructions. Also, we have to provide uh, consumer support instructions, and that might be a telephone number or email address or uh, a, a web address where you can obtain help. And then again, uh, that message and data rates may apply. Uh, and we'd have to let you know that in the advertisements that would be, that would be sent out advertising the program. As far as the opt-ins go, 
um, the um, uh, the consumer, there, there are double opt-in requirements under the MMA guidelines, and I frequently get questions about this, whether when you're engaging in a texting pl- uh, campaign that you have consent for, do you also have to get consent again, basically a double opt-in from the consumer to verify that they actually did want to receive those text messages. And um, so um, once a consumer has opted in to say, uh, receive our, our law firm's blogs, uh, we would have to, once receiving the consumer's um, text that they did want to opt in, uh, we would have to send, in, uh, send back a message confirming uh, that they did actually want to subscribe to the uh, MNS uh, Compliance Now blog posts. And if they did not uh, send back a Y for yes or a yes, uh, then we would not have an opt-in for uh, that consumer under the, the best practices. And, so would not be able to, under the do- double opt-in standard, to send them uh, additional messages. Um, it's important to know about the opt-outs, that a consumer can opt out at any time, and that a platform must recognize uh, stop requests. Uh, and this is under the guidelines. I, I would also say this is under the TCPA, though, as well, for revoking consent. Uh, so if a consumer wants to opt out, they have to be able to opt out under, uh, send- by sending a stop uh, and then it's also recommended that you would recognize things like quit, um, subscribe, and cancel, uh, those types of things. And then under the MMA guidelines, a, a confirmatory text must be sent, meaning we've received your opt-out, you will receive no additional text messages. Uh, it's interesting because that confirmatory text, as you can imagine with the um, the escalation of plaintiff's attorneys in the class action arena, Uh, of the TCPA, they took that one-time opt-out confirmation text as a violation of the TCPA because once the consumer has sent this end or stop um, request to the texter, then they have revoked their consent. And so these companies that were trying to meet the best practices standards of the MMA guidelines uh, were actually violating the TCPA because they were texting after consent had been revoked. Uh, The FCC quickly came out, though, with a ruling that said that a company can send a one-time confirmatory text in in time that's in close proximity within five seconds of receiving that opt-out text and that uh, you couldn't add any additional materials like, uh, you know, do you really want to stop receiving our wonderful blogs uh, by sending this opt-out request? You couldn't do those types of things uh, or or sending promotional materials. Uh, And then also that while you could send a confirmatory text, you couldn't follow up with a phone call uh, to to, uh, confirm that the Uh, opt-out had been received. So uh, you are able to follow the MMA guidelines without violating the TCPA now uh, if you are following these FCC uh, declaratory ruling standards. So uh, with that, uh, that wraps up what we wanted to talk about with text messages. Again, everything we spoke about in the previous webinar applies as if it was a phone call. I believe that webinar is online and uh, uh, Nima or, or Jorgen, you could uh, correct me if I'm wrong here at some point during this presentation, but I do believe that that previous webinar is online if you'd like to go back and, and listen to that. So that wraps yeah. up the uh, texting portion. Yeah, and, and Michelle, just to add a little bit to this, when, when, when you guys are evaluating any technology provider, one thing we found that um, when you know, we work with our clients that come from other systems, they sometimes have a homegrown solution that they've either you know, went on a, like an Upwork.com and had somebody build for them, or they're mm-hmm. using some platform and they haven't really tested the opt-out capabilities to see if it exactly works that way. So I highly recommend that everybody, whatever you're currently using to, you know, test it out, run it through as if you were a consumer and see what the experience is like to um, make sure that it works and it adheres to all of these um, rules and regulations. Yeah, I think that's a that's great. At, um, that's a great point, Nima. I would also say that you know, for the platforms that you are using, and as, as we've said, we recommend that you find out if this could be considered an ATDS by getting a legal opinion on your platform. Um, but so the confirmatory texts raise a very interesting, um, a, a very interesting uh, scenario as well. So 
uh, usually with these confirmatory texts, um, you know, we will have a, a one-time opt-out, but we have to consider how that also plays in with the definition of an ATDS. So if those auto-responses, so if you're sending a response, which again, you're not required under the TCPA, it's just a guideline under the MMA standards, but if you are sending that confirmatory text, and that confirmatory text is sent automatically without any type of human intervention for sending that, that text message that confirms the opt-out, then that might affect the analysis of whether you're using an ATDS because it is sending a message automatically without any uh, type of um, intervention which, which might put it into the ATDS uh, world. So as you are working to determine what your texting platform is, make sure you consider that, that automatic confirmation text that you might want to do uh, to, compl to um, follow the best practices guidelines of the uh, MMA as uh, being something to, to consider. Anyway, so Josh, I hope I didn't go too far over my time. I'm going to turn it over to you now to talk about something that I think is way more interesting, and that's about uh, prior express written consent and uh, what's going on right now in the lead generation industry. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to just highlight one additional thing from, from what you were saying about the system recognizing um, a stop request or uh, the system also should recognize quit, unsubscribe, end, and cancel. Um, and also building off what Nima said, these opt-outs uh, are very important to be able to honor them because a consumer can opt out by any reasonable means. And there is some case law out there that shows that in the texting space, um, a consumer being able to send back any of those five words um, could be considered reasonable. So uh, again, just why it's so important to make sure that those opt-outs uh, work well in your system. So let's talk about uh, prior express written consent and lead generation. This is a, a hot topic uh, of the day. And just to recap, right, prior express written consent is required for marketing calls and texts to cell phones that are made using an automated uh, telephone dialing system, pre-recorded messages, or artificial or synthetic voices. Um, and I, I do want to just note for you that uh, systems that use like soundboard technology, for example, where people play pre-recorded snippets of sound, um, the Federal Trade Commission has taken the position that those uh, are the use of pre-recorded messages. So as Michelle mentioned before, what types of systems fall into these buckets? Um, is a very detailed analysis and can always have some surprises that, that you may not uh, have thought of. So it, it's always important to work with counsel to know uh, the system that you're using. But as we mentioned uh, in the prior webinar, pr prior express written consent requires that you disclose the seller, the number that's going to receive the calls, so the consumer is giving their consent to receive calls, that the calls are for a marketing purpose, the type of technology being used, such as ATDS or pre-recorded message, and that consent is not required for purchase. And then you need to get the consumer's signature. So on the slide on the screen, uh, this is an example of prior express written consent language that you might see on an online form, uh, right? So by checking this box, this person gives their electronic signature and consent that ACME our wonderful uh, pretend company here, uh, may contact them with offers at the phone number above. So we're pretending that this is at the bottom of a form, including by text message, auto dialer, or pre-recorded message, consent not required for purchase. And we've included the CTIA's language about message and data rates may apply. So when the consumer checks that box, um, they have evidenced their consent. And as was previously mentioned, we need this consent because the penalties under the TCPA are quite stiff, uh, $500 to $1,500 per call. And this money drives private litigants. So this year, um, there's looking like it's going to be about 3,000 TCPA cases filed. Um, that number does not take into account the cases that get resolved uh, pre-filing. So just someone makes a demand. Uh, and they get they get settled. So the the actual volume of litigation is is frankly a lot higher than this than this number shows. The other important aspect uh, for why we need prior express written consent is that it satisfies 
the written consent exemption under the national do not call rules. So if, uh, if, if you recall, uh, we have to scrub, if we're going to make uh, telemarketing calls or send telemarketing texts, we need to scrub against the national do not call registry unless an exemption applies. And the two main exemptions are written consent or an established business relationship. And there are some uh, requirements ar around uh, what qualifies as an EBR, uh, an established business relationship. But if you get that prior express written consent, then you've got written consent to satisfy that exemption. And so in the lead gen context, we see forms that vary uh, in the way that they present the companies that may contact the consumer. So I'm gonna take you through five examples here that uh, range from what I would say is um, least risky to um, most risky. And the general theme you'll see as I walk you through these five examples is the less specific you get in a form, the higher the risk goes up. And I'll explain why. So in this first form, uh, the lead generator is getting consent for then, you know, they themselves to call the consumer. Very specific, it's one company, um, and we know exactly who they are, right? So that's low risk. The next form, also low risk. Again, we're being very specific. We're naming the lead generator and Acme Company. And so the lead generator can pass along that consent uh, up to their client. Again, low, low risk. Now in the next form, we're getting into where we're identifying categories of companies. Um, because sometimes, you know, in the lead gen space, we don't know exactly what company is gonna get that lead. We might know it's gonna come from a, a certain bucket of companies, but we don't know exactly who. So in this third example, it's identifying the, the lead generator and up to four of its lending partners. So we're imagining for this uh, form that the consumer is on some type of lending website. Now this one, while it may not identify the specific, specific company, its risk level is still fairly low, maybe starting to get into the, the low moderate range um, because it does identify the type of company, so it's gonna be a lending company, and it's identifying a specific quantity. So you might be contacted by up to four. And one of the things that you can't really see on this slide, but uh, but the way these forms are traditionally structured, lending partners would be a hyperlink that would go to a list that would actually have the names of all of the lending partners who might get that lead. And that's important, right? Because we have to identify the seller. So the argument goes, if we say lending partners, we make that a hyperlink that the person can click and then they can see a list of all the potential lending partners that could get the lead. We're identifying the seller because that seller is going to be on that list. And again, we're being specific about the type of company and how many it may go to. And that type of company is fits with the site the consumer is on. Now, increasing the risk a little bit more is the fourth form here. So up to four of its marketing partners. So we're still imagining the consumer is on a lending website um, and now they're clicking uh, to, to give their consent here. And this is broader, it's, it's less specific, right? So it's not just lending companies. There might be uh, home services companies or insurance companies that are also on that list. So the more we start to diverge from what the consumer expects, uh, the higher the risk level goes. Then in the fifth sample, uh, it's just the lead generator and its marketing partners. So we're not even giving a quantity here. We're getting very general. And I will tell you from having worked in this, in this space, we sometimes see when the person clicks that marketing partners button, um, the list can be quite extensive. Uh, you could have you know, hundreds of companies on that list. And the more companies that are on that list and the more they vary from what the consumer is looking for on that website, the higher the risk level goes. Now, every company is gonna have its 
uh, level of risk that it's comfortable with. And so I'm not saying that any of these forms are an absolute, you know, yes or no, but you do need to work with your counsel to identify what you're comfortable with in terms of risk. And the FTC has some opinions uh, about this, as Michelle mentioned earlier. And this is where we've, we've seen a lot of uh, development here lately. So the FTC's uh, Bureau of Consumer Protection has a new chief. His name is Andrew Smith. And he is personally very interested in this issue. And he was recently quoted um, as saying that he wants to eliminate this quote, ecosystem of deceit. And so he's driving uh, personally a lot of the FTC's efforts here. And one good evidence uh, that they are uh, taking this matter very seriously is their recent Operation Call It Quits. This was a joint effort uh, between the FTC, the Department of Justice, and a number of state attorneys general that resulted in 94 enforcement actions against companies that used uh, telemarketing as part of their uh, sales practices. And this included actions against lead generators and the companies who buy those leads. Now, Operation Call It Quits was focused very heavily on DNC violations. And remember a few slides ago, I mentioned what well, prior express written consent is very important because it meets that written consent exemption to the do not call laws. Um, and a lot of the, the call it quits actions, uh, what they found was that these companies didn't scrub against the do not call registry, they called numbers on the registry, and they didn't meet any exemption. So what we saw were companies that thought they met that written consent standard uh, or thought that the leads that they were buying met that written consent standard, and then they didn't. Um, and suffered huge penalties as a result. The other thing that uh, they were focusing on were UDAP violations, so unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts and practices. Things like misrepresentations um, or uh, marketing products that had no value to consumers. Um, so they were, they were looking at that as well. Um, so not just strictly around uh, DNC type issues, also looking at some substantive issues, but those DNC violations were where a lot of these companies really, really racked up penalties. And so what is the FTC saying? Well, first is those multi-collar multi forms that we were uh, talking about earlier. So those samples uh, three, four, and five um, with lists they think are insufficient um, for two reasons. One, consumers are not anticipating calls about varying products or services. So think back to the example we were using of a, customer, of a consumer who's on a lending website. If they see a form like the one that's currently on your screen uh, with the lead generator and its marketing partners, and behind that marketing partner's link is a list that contains uh, uh, potential sellers that are in different areas, not lending, a consumer isn't expecting to get calls from those types of companies because they're on a lending website. So a consumer is going to interpret that phrase marketing partners to mean lenders. And so that's what the FTC um, feels is in, in some ways, uh, kind of a misrepresentation because of the way a consumer would think about the the phrasing. The second thing that they uh, took issue with are those forms that have hundreds of companies on them. Because in their mind, a reasonable consumer would never willingly agree to get calls from hundreds of companies. And especially if those companies are unrelated to the product that they're looking for, going back to the first bullet point. So we talked about this form here as being the highest risk uh, of the five forms. And these are the two main reasons why. Now, there are other reasons, uh, though, that Nima, I know you wanted to talk about um, why uh, people might want to have a, a, a tighter, narrower form 
uh, from a business perspective. So Nima, let us let us know your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, uh, this was really great, Josh. I mean, the, the way you know I look at it personally is quality over quantity, and you know while I, I don't think necessarily if you go to any any place where you're buying leads or they're generating leads and they may have a long list of them, you got to just make sure that are they really selling that lead only to a certain number of people? Do your due diligence, talk to them, figure that out. Um, the bottom line is if, if you're getting volume, uh, it may not end up working out the best. We see those that buy, for example, aged leads, which depending on how aged they are, may or may not always work out the best because now you're dialing through more leads to get in touch. You have uh, longer wait times between calls. And so what, what we see working best with our clients are those that really focus on quality and maybe a bit of quantity, but they figure out, you know, they, they want consumers that have actually expressed interest in their product or service. As a result, they have a higher talk time, their contact rate is up. And in an environment like a call center where one of your biggest expenses is the labor, um, you know, you, you got to think about what's, what's it worth paying for a lead um, if it's not of quality. And then, and especially real-time leads is really what we see work best. They might cost more, but when we look at the performance of our clients that are using real-time leads versus aged, the contact rates, the talk time, the conversion rates are all much, much um, higher. So I really wanna emphasize the point that what Josh is saying here is really evaluate where the leads are being generated from, see how they're being generated, ask them a lot of questions to make sure you know what uh, lead you're getting and where you know where they've expressed interest in specifically. Yeah, and that's an excellent point. Um, and you know where where time is money. Um, I think you hit it right on the nose uh, with those those agents. You want to make sure they are they are calling leads who are really interested in the products and services that they're selling. Exactly. Now the FTC also. Um, has taken uh, some some concern or issue with uh, what we have seen as maybe a, a lower risk or moderate risk form, which is one that does identify a quantity and type of partners. Um, and their concern with these types of forms is that the disclosure may not be clear and conspicuous enough. Um, and here's here's the background for this. A Hyperlinked disclosure and the use of hyperlinked disclosures is permitted under the FTC's .com disclosure guide, which came out, oh, I believe it was 2003. It's, it's a bit dated. Um, but the rationale in that guidance was that in a space-constrained uh, advertisement, and what they were really contemplating were things like banner ads, um, you don't have a lot of room for uh, some lengthy disclosure. So could you put um, the disclosure behind a hyperlink? And what they said was in a space-constrained context, yes. Um, you, you could put that behind a hyperlink, but that hyperlink needs to be well-labeled and very clear and conspicuous so the consumer knows exactly what's behind it. Um, and the concern that they have had with the type of form that's on your screen is whether a consumer is going to know um, exactly that that phrase lending partners, they need to click on it, that that's a hyperlink um, that they need to click on and go look at that list. So if you're using this type of form, make sure uh, to have lending partners look like a hyperlink. Um, because that, that will improve that argument of clear and conspicuous disclosure. And another thing re relating to this I do want to point out is the FTC is not the only player in this space. Almost every state has its own set of telemarketing regulations. And we have heard uh, from other attorneys um, who are starting to experience um, issues with certain states um, having issues with these forms under their state laws. And one state in particular that, that we were put on alert about was Pennsylvania. Um, the Pennsylvania is starting to take a very hard line um, that the seller 
really needs to have their name in the form. So when you're working with your council to figure out the way to, to craft your forms, um, always keep in mind what states may do in addition to the FTC. Another area that the FTC's expressed concern relates to incentivized forms. So these are forms where a consumer uh, gets something like a sweepstakes entry or a gift card um, in return for completing the form, which is something that's very commonly used uh, out, out in the market. And the FTC feels that those incentives likely negate the consent. And it's a little, so you got to go a couple steps to follow the logic on this one, but their argument essentially is that that sweep six and that gift card are so distracting. The consumer is so interested um, in that incentive that they're not actually reading the form and they're just checking the box and going on. Um, so essentially the incentive makes the disclosure not clear and conspicuous. And I think a lot of us could really argue about that, um, but that's, that is something that, that they're, they're starting to take issue with. One thing that they definitely uh, will get you on is if you offer a sweepstakes entry or you offer a gift card and then you don't fulfill it um, because that is a straight up uh, misrepresentation deception issue. So if you do use incentivized forms and you offer sweepstakes or gift cards uh, as part of that, make sure that you do uh, fulfill whatever you promise because um, that, is, that is probably one of the fastest ways to get on the FTC's uh, radar. Another issue is when a form is made to look like another company's website to trick a consumer into giving their information thinking that they're giving it to that other company. And where I have seen this um, is with forms or websites that are set up to look uh, like Amazon. This is, this is what I've seen frequently. Um, they use the Amazon colors, they use the Amazon fonts, they um, use the same sort of layouts. So they're, it really looks like Amazon. Um, and they offer an Amazon gift card in exchange for completing the form. And there's nothing in the form or anywhere on the website that says, hey, we're not Amazon. Um, so what the FTC has said, if you, if you are um, mimicking another company uh, in order to, to get someone to give you their information and that consumer is likely to think they're giving it to that other company, then you're, you're misrepresenting. Um, it also raises some privacy issues and, and I just uh, want to say, I don't want to get into it though because uh, we are limited on time here, but it does raise privacy issues. And in particular with the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act that um, is coming into effect on January 1, um, it's very important that you have the right uh, disclosures, privacy policies, uh, and whatnot on your site. And if uh, the site is designed to mimic someone else, that could be an issue of the consumer's information is going to someone that they did not consent it being provided to. In addition to the FTC, courts uh, are also chiming in on these issues, um, mostly related to where the disclosure language is positioned and how the person gives their consent. So first is a number of courts have said that disclosure needs to be above the, sub the submit button. Um, if it's below the button, a consumer is not likely to see it, especially since most consumers these days are viewing things on iPads or mobile devices. They don't scroll past the button. So it really needs to be above the button. Additionally, the consumer needs to take some sort of affirmative action, like checking a box. Using pre-checked boxes um, isn't sufficient because the consumer doesn't have to do anything. Uh, it's it's inertia. It's the act of not doing something uh, with a pre-check box. So don't, don't use pre-checked boxes if you're going to use a check box. Um, make the consumer actually check it. And recently there was a case, um, and this one's actually still being uh, litigated, uh, but a, a court found that a consumer did not actually agree 
to a set of terms and conditions. So it's a little different context, but it's, it's still based around this clear and conspicuous principle. Um, the, the court found they didn't agree to, the, to a set of terms and conditions because even though there was a terms and conditions disclosure above the button and it was black text against a white background, it was noticeable, the button itself said continue. It didn't say I agree. And so what the court said was that that was insufficient to manifest that consumer's intent uh, to agree. So when you're thinking about a consent form, I think you also have to think about what does the button itself say? If it says something like next or continue, then that might be a more difficult argument to make than if the button says, I agree uh, or call me, right? Um, so the, the point of this is when you're crafting your forms, you really do have to take into account every piece of the form, not just the disclosure language itself. You really have to look at, at the whole thing in context. So what should you do? What sort of risk mitigation measures should you take? Well, something you might think about is disclosing the potential callers in your prior express written consent language. So what I've put here on the screen is an example where we actually list all the companies that might contact this consumer. Now, this really probably only works if you're gonna be selling that lead to just a handful of companies. If that lead could potentially go to one of dozens of companies, this, this might not work. One thing I have seen some clients do uh, is investigate whether they can dynamically code this language so that once the system identifies uh, based on the completion of the form what a uh, couple clients that lead's going to go to, they can then insert those names into the form uh, and capture that consent uh, in in a form such as this. Um, there obviously are going to be some challenges around that. That's not going to be practical for everyone, um, but just an idea to consider as a risk mitigation measure. Another thing you could consider is if you're generating leads for multiple product types, use separate consent boxes um, for each of those product types, right? So uh, going back to the example we talked uh, earlier about with a consumer who's going to a lending site, um, let's say it's a mortgage lending site, they might want to do some improvements on this home that they're about to buy. So it would be appropriate uh, to maybe offer them, uh, offer to put them in touch with some home improvement companies, right? So what you could do to mitigate your risk is you could give them two separate check boxes, um, one for the lending uh, offers and another for the home improvement offers. And if you can't put every company's name in, like I did here, at least you're improving the argument, uh, similar to the form we mentioned earlier, that you are keeping the consent focused on the specific type of products and services the consumer wants. And always place that disclosure above the submit button and require separate affirmative consent. That's another, it's another thing you can do. Now this form on your screen is not a good form. Uh, this form is something that the FTC actually put together as a sample of a bad form. Uh, even though it looks looks very nice, uh, great colors, nice stock photo, uh, this, this form has a lot of issues. Uh, the first being it has absolutely no consent language. Um, and so if you put that, you, you want to put that consent language in there um, and you want to put it, if you're looking at this form, probably between that phone box and the submit button. And I would recommend having a little checkbox for them to check there. Um, I would also recommend having a privacy policy in terms of use uh, linked at the bottom. One thing I would caution you against doing is merging your prior express written consent disclosure with your uh, terms and conditions and privacy uh, um, uh, disclosures. And I've, I've jumped ahead of myself a little bit here. Uh, it's the second bullet here on the slide on your screen now. 
Um, and the reason for this is it reduces how clear and conspicuous that prior express written consent language is. Um, there has been some guidance and there have been some cases that have said that when that language gets bundled with everything else, the consumer doesn't really see it. So if you're gonna have somebody accept a terms and conditions and privacy policy, I would recommend that be a separate disclosure with its own checkbox, then um, uh, that, that is separate from the prior express written consent disclosure and checkbox. Um, another thing that I would caution against doing is putting the prior express written consent language in the middle of a bunch of miscellaneous disclosures. So what I have seen done uh, before is someone will create a paragraph that maybe the, has like three sentences that uh, talk about the, the company and, and the, the things they try to do, and then they put the prior express written consent disclosure, and then they have a couple more sentences about their terms of use and their privacy policy and, and maybe you know taxes or something, and it's this, it's this big block of text. Um, that's likely not going to be clear and conspicuous uh, for purposes of prior express written consent. So let's backtrack here to the first, the first bullet on this slide. Um, I'd recommend against using incentives uh, for form completion, uh, such as sweepstakes or gift cards. Although I will caveat that with, it might be okay if you make that consent really obvious. So if you do some things to highlight um, that consent disclosure, maybe you make it a little bigger, uh, maybe you, you put it in bold font, um, or you, you separate it in time from the sweepstakes or gift card offer. So you're reducing that argument that the FTC has that the consumer is so distracted um, by potentially winning that sweepstakes that they're not paying attention to the consent language. Um, so a few thoughts there. Uh, for ways you might be able to, to structure that. And if you're a buyer of leads, you really do need to make sure you know where those leads are coming from, how they're generated, and know that those lead generators are complying with those latest best practices. You know, going back to, to Nima's comment earlier, quality over quantity, right? If, if those leads are being generated um, in a compliant fashion, where consumers are really like they're really interested in that product or service, um, those are going to convert at much better rates than um, just some you know lead that comes out of uh, 400 uh, names pulled out of a hat, right? So um, so focus on that quality over uh, quantity. And so that's all for me. Um, and uh, Nima, Michelle. If you'd like to, to share thoughts, uh, obviously, I'd love to, love to have them. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, got, you know, the, the content on here is intended to inform everyone as much as possible. Some, some of it may feel scary, but honestly, the, the way to look at it is it's information so that you can act on it and do something with it and work with counsel to really figure out where do you need to tighten up things and where do you have some loose ends. Uh, ultimately, what that will do is you'll adapt. If some of these things are maybe, not, are maybe not happening right now, I think the message here is that apply them, adapt. And instead of being in a state of survival, you know, the whole point is to thrive. And I really believe that if you guys just take this information and, and take uh, work with counsel so that you'll be able to do that. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, we definitely know that the regulatory community is focused on uh, robocalls. I, I hate the term, but it's what everybody uses, and that um, to the extent that consumers are getting calls that they don't expect uh, and that they don't believe that they have given consent for, that creates uh, problems from uh, you know, lots of different perspectives, as Nima was pointing out, from the contact rate perspective, uh, from blocking and labeling of, of calls by carriers. Uh, we know that as a result of the recent blocking by default order from the FCC that allows uh, telecom providers to block telephone calls uh, by default that are uh, unwanted, 
uh, or illegal, um, basically um, telemarketing messages that they feel um, were not consented to by the consumers to a certain extent, um, that that's going to cause problems as far as contact rates go. So it's really, I think it's really critically important to understand uh, you know, the content of what Josh is talking about and what's likely to lead to um, the best uh, contact rates, the least amount of complaints, and the least amount of regulatory attention. And by all means, uh, you definitely want to make sure that your consent forms have a defendable position. And that, that's what Nima is talking about with uh, obtaining advice from legal counsel. Uh, you should have all of your leads uh, your, leads, uh, your lead language reviewed by counsel because you really do live or die by that language. It is either provided you consent or it hasn't, and you're going to want to make sure you have a defendable position that it is providing consent for the type of marketing that you want to engage in. And Michelle, just to, to add to that, you know, I, I said this earlier, it's, it's not just the lead language, right? The entire form really needs right. to be reviewed. Um, right. it, because it's, every, it's everything in context. And I, I think, you know, a lot of companies um, don't, don't realize that, um, you know, they focus specifically on the language and think, well, I've got the magic words in here, but in addition to the magic words, it needs to be clear and conspicuous. It needs to fit with the form, right? And then what else is on the form could potentially get you in trouble. So it's really working with counsel to have the whole form and the whole customer uh, funnel, right? That get that whole process reviewed. Definitely, I mean, you know, we're here, you guys are here, right? Please reach out to us after the fact, any questions you guys have. Um, we do have some questions here, so we'll get to those also after the fact, um, and we'll make sure to get that information over to you guys. Yeah, thank you, everyone. That concludes our webinar for today. We appreciate you guys attending and hope you got as much value out of it as we put into it. Uh, stay tuned for um, invites for future webinars. We'll do another one in about a month, date to be determined. So you guys will all be notified. And again, thank you to all of you guys for presenting here, Michelle, Josh, Nima. This is excellent. And uh, that's it for, for today. Feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you. Thank you.